Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. And today's show is going to be featuring Shaman Durek, a sixth generation shaman and author, a visionary. Shaman Durek gives us back the power so we can live consciously, authentically, and in alignment. The Dare to Dream podcast won the COVR Award for Best Radio and Podcast Show. Welp Magazine listed Dare to Dream as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. It is top ranked in Apple Podcasts under self-improvement and nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards and for a Webby Award. Show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness. They do great energy work out into the world. So if you'd like to become a facilitator or attend a class, go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R dot com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I am a media visibility specialist. I'm a book writing coach and people from all around the world meet with me twice a month on Zoom so they can take their book from inception to completion. I also have an independent company that takes your book to a guaranteed international best-selling status, and I do all the heavy lifting for the author. And finally, I do some very boutique publicity work out into the world. And to that end, I've been also interviewed on over 2,000 media outlets. So I really know this system. I've researched it. It's become a life's mission. And I teach spiritual messengers how to be interviewed on radio and podcast. So you don't even have to hire a publicist. I've got some free gifts for you so you can start right away and learn how to do this. Go to debbie-shinger.com slash gift. That's D E B B I. D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash gift. My guest, Shaman Durek, sixth generation shaman, author of the bestseller Spirit Hacking, Shamanic Keys to Reclaim Your Personal Power, Transform Yourself, and Light Up the World. And he's also a visionary to the now age. His online shaman school and healing temple are instrumental in helping people tap into their personal power and unblocking negative patterns that have prevented them from reaching optimal human performance. Dirk's teachings have impacted thousands of people from diverse public figures like Nina Dobrev and Gwyneth Paltrow to biohacking giants like Dave Asprey. In his recurring role on the TV show, The Doctors, Shaman Durek aided guests in overcoming challenges between their emotional, physical well-being. He's been profiled in People magazine, and his work has been recognized globally by major mainstream publications like Elle, Marie Claire, Los Angeles Times, The New York Times, You Magazine, The Times, and featured on Netflix, Bling Empire. For more information, go to his website, Shaman Durek.com. And with that, I welcome Shaman Durek to Dare to Dream. It is so amazing to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here. And I am so honored that you have chosen for me to be on your powerful, beautiful place of sharing. Yeah, this was a divine experience waiting to happen. I am so grateful you're here because I have wanted to have this conversation. And now that I've researched you, can I just start with some of the clips I saw from the doctors? That is next level healing work. OMG. I am so impressed with what I saw. And what was so interesting to me, besides the magnitude of what you facilitate, and I recommend everybody listening or watching Go look at those clips on his website. There are four of them, three minutes, powerful. You also deliver this healing, Shaman Jerk, with there's this deep calm when you are connected with your guides and clearly this deep conversation and communication that we can't hear that's going on. So can you share, like pull back the curtain and share a little bit, what is that like for you to be in that space with that tribe of unseens helping you? You know, when I was a child, I was in my crib as a, as a little boy 
and I would see spirits coming into the room and having conversations with me. Some came from Nordic, some came from African, some came from Native American, and they would come into the room and other beings even from other places as well, not even from Earth, and they would tell me things, you know? And as I grew up, I, I, I started to listen to what they had to say from a very young age. Because I wasn't, I, they thought I was an autistic kid because I didn't speak, but I only spoke to the spirits. Mm. And so, and I would whisper in my sister's ear when I needed to say something, and then she would speak on my behalf to the family, to people around me, and so forth. So, for me, people thought I was, you know, uh, there, that something was wrong with me from the from the Western world perspective. But for me, it's always been a relationship with everything. Like if I'm walking down the street, for instance, a tree will start speaking to me. So I turn around and I say something back. Or if I walk down the street and I hear, I hear a voice say, the woman sitting on the bench, tell her her son's going to be okay and that he's going to survive the surgery. So I go and I sit down on the bench and I go, I know you don't know me, ma'am. And I know this may sound crazy, but I'm a messenger. And so... I'm here to deliver a message. Your son is going to make it through surgery and God wants you to know that. And then she would be like, that's what I was praying about all morning. My son is in surgery right now. Mm -hmm. And it was just always these types of things. And I would be in school, for instance, and my teacher would be a little edgy during that day. And I would hear this voice say to me, well, the reason why she's edgy, because she was fighting with her husband last night about the real estate plans that they have. And, and so I told her, I, I said, you know, it would be nice if you didn't take out a lot of your home stuff on us kids, you know, because we're doing the best that we can. And she's like, what do you mean? And I said, you're fighting with your husband about the real estate because you guys want to sell the house. And, um, and it's been a, a difficult situation. And she's like, how did you know that? I said, oh, the spirits told me. And so, you know, so, and, and it just always has been that way. And I, and over the years, like even when I was a kid and I used to have these, spirits that would be in my closet and my friends would tell me oh these scary things at night and i would go to my closet and ask the spirit why are you in my closet why are you under my bed why are you trying to make me scared and then it would tell me and it would say well you you are a, a passenger and i said well, what's a passenger and they said the spirit said well you have the ability to travel into our world and not and, and be able to commune with us and I, and I asked the spirit, well, where are you from? And it said, I'm from the underworld. And I said, well, why do you want to scare kids? And it says, because we don't want you ever to come into our realm with your light because we don't feel worthy of love. So we are here to scare you so that when you grow up, you'll always be afraid of the unknown. And so I learned a lot about that. And then it just stayed with me and got stronger and stronger over the years. And it's funny because my... I'm a spirit shaman where there's different types of shamans in the world. There's earth shamans who deal with plant medicines, water shamans like you find in Hawaii and Bali, Indonesia, Philippines, who do submerging of you in water, making baths for you, dumping water over your head and praying for you. And then there's fire shamans who deal with tamaskal and um, the, the hot stone sweating, sun ceremonies. And then there's the air shamans who deal with um, speaking in tongues, or people call it light language now and they do guttural sounds or they play instruments like people who love sound bowls and all that those are we would call that um, um air shamans and then there's spirit shamans and spirit shamans communicate to all forms of spirit so i've always had that ability and being the fact that in my family uh it's been a, a great blessing to have my family members who are there to, to help me strengthen that skill because it exists in our family from my grandmother and, and through her father and, and his mother who are all shamans. And it skipped my father because he walked away from it because he felt like he couldn't make a living being a shaman in the 1920s, which I thought, you know, uh, was quite interesting. But nonetheless, he still had powers. And so he would always say to me, don't show the world those things. They're not, the people will try to ridicule you. They'll try to rip you apart keep it to yourself. And one day I was in school, I was about it was five, it was almost going on six. And I was in the playground on the inner the tube, the thing, the tire, it's called the tire, tire swing. 
And there was this girl who was playing with me and I touched her hands and I saw her hair falling out and she was in so much pain and I started screaming on the top of my lungs. And so my teacher uh, came out, Miss Serena, and she came out and she said, what's going on? And I said, she's dying, she's dying, something is eating her, you know? And so my father came to school to pick me up and the parents came and it was like a big fiasco. And they had me in the office with the girl, with my dad, with her parents. And, and my teacher was like, why were you screaming that? And I said, because I could see something's going on. And her mom said she was just diagnosed with leukemia. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, my dad was so angry at me because he said to me, I told you not to use your powers outside of the house. So he like dragged me across the playground, like by my jacket and like, you know, put me in the car and said, I forbid you to use your powers outside of this house. Like, this is not okay. People will not understand. They will think that you're doing something bad and, and you, you know, it's just not a good thing. So I, 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 I kind of had a difficulty in um, feeling safe. And I think that was a huge part of my growth was to, to, to feel safe being me. Mm. Wow. Yeah. I understand you had a really tumultuous past and childhood, mostly connected to your gifts and the trying to beat the gifts out of you and get you to be sinless and all of this. Um, very, very traumatic. Do you feel like today everything you're speaking to has actually, um, au contraire, created who you've become with even more potency, that all of that was just like boiling inside of you, waiting to come out even greater than it would have maybe if it had a smooth path? Absolutely. You know, one of the things I asked when I was really young through all the abuse that I went through, the physical abuse, the mental abuse, the sexual abuse, like everything that I, you know, had gone through, I asked God, I said, you know, God, why weren't you there to, to save me from these things? Mm -hmm. And, um, and God said, you know, that's your construct. Your construct is because you go through something, I'm supposed to jump in and save you. But you didn't ask me you know, what, 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 I'm, what role I'm to play through this experience, you asked me not to interfere so that you can, this is going to help you to define your, your principles of love for humanity in a deeper way. And it was interesting because I remember saying to my sister that there's two ways we can go here. We're in so much pain, we're getting beaten, we're locked in closets, locked in rooms for three months at a time. I mean, I literally was living flowers in the attic and mommy dearest through my stepmom. And on top of that, people, friends won't let me spend a night at their home or go to their birthday parties because they, they I had powers and they thought I was the devil worshiper. I mean, it was all, all these different things. And then my grandfather walked away from the shop, didn't like, walked away from the shamanic side of the family and became... Catholic, which is where we had a lot of people who had um, in our time had to hide a lot of their gifts in Catholicism. And then he went from Catholic to Seventh day Adventist. And all of a sudden, I'm having my dad's putting in sinks and two drawers for, for meat and milk. And, you know, we're, we're doing Shabbat and, you know, we're being, you know, I don't even have a childhood anymore because now my only time to play is on Sunday, but it's after church. Saturday, we're having Shabbat. Friday night with Shabbat dinner. So it was very interesting and very confusing for me. But then I said to myself, the more pain I go through, the more love I'm going to go into. I'm going to just keep going into love. And every time they hurt me, I'm just going to go deeper into love. And what that did for my sister and I is it made us become these very patient, loving beings towards humanity and understanding the why people do what they do, why they say what they say, when someone is screaming or acting out or anything, I don't get involved in the need to, to go into that same energy space. I hold space for them. I say, I see that you are upset how can I best um, support you right now? How can I best 
help you right now or be there. And then whatever they ask me to do, I do from the place of love. It doesn't matter who's right and wrong. My, my, my whole understanding is to create a space of love that is seen and felt even in the midst of chaos or discomfort or any of these things. And what it did was it allowed me to go to live, uh, you know, I lived in countries all over the world. I lived in Israel for four years through two wars, which were really intense. Um, Palestine, I lived in Turkey for two wars with ISIS. Um, at Gazi and Tep, I watched people get burned alive. I watched the most horrific things that people could do to each other. And I've seen the most beautiful things that human beings can do. And what I've learned from all of that is that the primal um, do dominating duality based aspects of humanity are still existing on the planet. But then above that duality, there is this beautiful coming together, this wholeness, people seeking to find community, to find family within family. And that's exactly what God wants for us. And I have a direct connection with God. I, I, I don't, I listen to what people say and I hear what they have to say, but I always make sure that the information is source code, that it's coming directly from source. It hasn't been changed or manipulated or any of these things. And I've studied world religion. I went to Christian school. I studied Quran um, in, in Muslim countries that I lived. I studied the Talmud in the Torah. I studied the Bhagavad Gita, the Ugavad Gita. I've been in so many different spiritual um, observances. And what I have found is I've taken out everything that was not love and put it aside and took everything from everyone's cultures and religions that is love and put it in front of me and begin to utilize the knowledge and wisdom from those things that so that I am understanding people not from the way people uh, put up their mask or their their walls, but from who they really are and loving who they really are and using my mouth and tongue to edify humanity, to, to constantly speak light into people, to communicate to their minds of their greatness, their possibility, the beauty, their intellect, their geniusness, their capability to see themselves as these walking shamans, as these powerful beings, that can do anything and everything when they come into that place of alignment with God's love for them. Not God that was created by the system in the matrix to keep people in a subconscious breakdown by making people afraid of God so that they could be afraid of themselves because they're a child of God, but the God of love that loves you unconditionally when you are having bad days, when you don't, when you are putting yourself down, when you're being hard on yourself, still loving you when you make mistakes and helping people understand that this, when we came from heaven, when we're in heaven, it is held in the energy of pure conscious love. So everything we create is playful and fun and beautiful. And it happens like this, whereas in this realm, we were given an opportunity to, to shift those frequencies through the help of the um, reptilians. And the reptilians, what they did is created a buffer system so that it allows us so that when we create, it doesn't happen right away and it gives us time to refine ourselves. Because a lot of times what people want to do is always take ETs and beings and make this one is dark and this one is light and this one does this and this one does that. And when I travel to the underworld and I talk to spirits in the darkness, they're like, who amplifies light? We do. Every time we come and create an effect in your life, it, it makes you use your powers. And I said, you're right. And then they educated me and told me how the souls in the underworld, because they have unfinished business, they need, they don't feel worthy to come fully home into the light of love. So they wait for us. They talk to, when we hear some negative thoughts in our head, that's not us. That's them talking to us and we should know the difference that we are always love. We are a child of love. We are love for the sake of love. And, and so everything else is a spirit communicating to us because there's some part of our being that is asking to be held back. 
And so instead, what do we do? We blame everything around us instead of say, wait a second. Darkness amplifies light. I don't need to be afraid of the dark. I have to understand the darkness as an ally from a different perspective, but at the same time, transmute the darkness through bringing it into the light, holding it in, the, in, in love. And every time I started doing that with people, their lives changed. I can imagine that is really powerful. And I got to say, my body is having all sorts of tingles listening to you talk so inspiring and so to our hearts. I'm very grateful. And when you talk about the underworld, you'll have to forgive me. I, I'm a graduate of shaman school with Dr. Alberto Viotto. So I'm mostly aware of the Peruvian, the Inca, the, the Quechua way of being, the Inca way of being. And I know for us in the underworld, Huascar is the Lord down there. Um, is that what you're talking about? Or what? what is your underworld that you're referring to? So in African shamanism, we have the above um, dimension, which is the realm of infinite light spectrum, where it's a place where you are so loved that you can express yourself in all spectrums quantumly and multidimensionally. So that means all of your, how do we say, um, restraints, restrictions uh, are all completely lifted. And in that realm, there is what we call the, um, the center place of that space, which people call heaven. We basically call it a place in which to experience yourself as, as the creator, as you. And then you can go into any other dimension or incarnate on any other planet or any of these things. And then in the middle plane is the earth experience. And it's the, it's the light trapped in matter. And it's the matter substance, meaning held by different beings to give us an opportunity to refine ourselves as creators. So to so that we're not creating and things happen right away like it does in the higher planes, because we actually have to raise our consciousness to not utilize our thinking or emotions or our words or our actions that would self-destruct us, self-destruct someone else, desecrate something or create chaos or destruction. So we get a chance to, to be in observance of that in this realm. People call it karma, people call it whatever, but really what it is, it's, it's your being showing you how you operate in your own creative process through the interactions of your brothers and sisters as you and as them. So me being you, you being me, we, if I say something powerful and beautiful to you, it's because I resonate with that code within myself. So therefore I can see it within you. And if I say something not so beautiful to you, that's because I'm telling you how I feel within my code. And then your job is to, to deny it or not to accept it because you already know you're the child of God. Right. But on this planet, people are still accepting false codes and not operating in source intelligence. And then the, 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 the underworld is the plane where the beings that have unfinished business, when they died, the light showed them everything that they did, every occurrence and every person that it affected and the rippling waves that went out through the universe. And they decided to turn away from the light. And so they go to the underworld and it, it looks like earth. Some people dream of it. Sometimes they'll have dreams like of a red sky or they can't turn on a light in their dream or, you know, it's, it looks like earth. It's just a little bit different. And there's different layers of the underworld depending upon how, where the spirit's consciousness is. And in the, um, underworld that's closest to the middle plane, those are the beings that have unfinished business. And so they feel like they're helping you by being doubt or being fear or, or being control or being any of these things. So you call them in and then they, they do things. Like when people hear a voice in their head that says you're not good enough, that's an underworld spirit talking to you to see if you accept, accept your truth, which is that you're the child of God and you are the likeness of God and you are the pure love energy and source that is here on this planet to emulate and, and to stimulate the awareness of, of possibility, 
Or do you accept the program that this spirit is telling you as you because it takes on your own voice? And so people have to, um, in order to transmute this spirit, you have to send it into the light. But what the spirit will do, some spirits will say, well, you're not powerful enough to send me to the light. Or people, it makes people believe that they don't have the power to transform or to, how do we say in, in shamanism, is to be the alchemist. And so when we step into recognizing that we didn't come to earth because we needed to learn something, no, where we come from, we are so powerful and so capable of so much knowledge and wisdom. We come to earth to free our brothers and sisters behind the veil of disillusionment who are in the underworld who been have not come home. So I didn't come to earth to fix this planet. I came to earth to create a new planet by lifting my brothers and sisters out of the darkness, which is called ascension, and then ascending all of us together once we get our family out of the darkness. And, but see, the system that um, is being held in what we call old, old order of sorcery has built a, uh, an understanding that in order to enslave people, they used to enslave them through indoctrinations of power and position. But now they realize that that's not going to work for humanity. They don't want the underworld beings freed. They want to keep Earth as a place of dominion that they can rule over. And so what they have done through generations and generations is create a system that makes you become the person who enslaves yourself mentally, emotionally, and physically. And they do so by creating all types of um, things they feed you through the media, uh, wars that they create and then tell you lies about it, uh, keeping um, extraterrestrials away from interacting with us with new technology, um, ways to help us advance ourselves in our, in our connectivity and as well as in how we facilitate our, our realizing that our brain is just a third finite organ, that we have a consciousness that expands in what we call um, uh, defined coding. And those defined codings are frequencies that we're finding out now more about. But shamans have known this from the very beginning because of the knowledge that has come from the spirits, from the nature spirits, from the medicines, from the, the rituals that shamans held. And the first shamans were not men. And that's they another were thing. women. They I'm were about women. to go to Mexico City and deliver a presentation at a World Congress UFOlogy event. And I, I thank you so much for what you're saying. I'm so tracking and it, and forgive my outburst, but it okay. is hundred percent true. 2.6 million years ago at the inception of shamanism, the goddesses were the shamans. They put the bones back together. They healed. They were able to go into trance. That's and correct. That is why millennia later, when men started to say, I would like that skill too. And they started to figure out how to go into alternate consciousness to do this work, especially in Siberia, you will notice the shaman men dress like women. That's correct. As an homage. So That's yes, yes. this is exactly correct. And it's been around for so long. It ha it has. And the, the reason... You know, it's very fascinating because when I was being trained in shamanism from my family, my grandmother and my aunt used to always say to me, never forget the, the grace and the love that the women who were the elders of shamanism made way for you mm -hmm. as a man in the embodiment of this body mm -hmm. to step in and hold those energies so when you see so they always told me to embrace my feminine side I love that. um because and to honor women because women were known as the what we call in african culture um the root holders so the root the rooted women were the ones who were healing and speaking the spirit and seeing the other the dimension the other dimensions and going through death and rebirth ceremonies and being able to master those energies to be able to bring back knowledge from the spirit world to the physical world. 
And men, it's men started wanting to dominate over the women intelligence. I, um, you know, it, it's even as it even goes as far to say that when I train women in shamanism and I train men in shamanism, it's a very different energy. I'll bet. When I train men in shamanism, I have to deal with a lot of red tape and a lot of their need to not want to be vulnerable and their need to kind of create all of these cascading identities, I say, that limit them from being able to be in an authentic place with the elders, with the spirits, with the nature spirits, with the beings that are there to support them because they feel that they have to prove something to me. And that doesn't make it easier for me to be able to show them the, the, what is capable in the spirit world. So if I say to them, you know, don't swim in this river until we talk to the river spirits and ask, is it okay for you to go into this river? They, it's hard for them to understand that. Mm. But when I say to my female um, student, uh, what I call um, students, remember, I always say, I don't want to say students because I don't see myself as a teacher. I see myself as a grand sharer, but I always believe that everyone is just remembering. It's nothing that we don't already know. So women, for instance, understand that. They grasp it more. Even when I take them into training and I have them go into uh, certain trances to have the elder women from um, the old world of Pangea come through, it's easier for them to access these spirits than I've noticed with men because they don't want to get into that feminine place that you have to get to to access that doorway. And so whenever I walk around, I always see these male shamans always spouting out all this information. But then when I go and listen to them, it's very masculine. It's very held in a very masculine way. It's, it's, it's not holding the nurturing, the, 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 the sensual, the, the, the tantalizing, the, the, the seductive energies of, of spirit, of the beauty of pulling and webbing these beautiful magnetic energies through movement, through dance, through words, through um, the connection to spirit, the reverence, the devotion. And so it's like, I have to constantly go, why do you, why are you so hard? Why are you so, why are you making this so serious? That's not spirit. Spirit's not serious at all. In fact, spirit is playful and jovial and, and free and sensual and, and, and orgasmic. And every time I'm listening to a shaman male, they're like, and, and, and it's like this. And I, I just go, whoa. You know, and, and, and it's not it's 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 missing the old touch of the of the first women shamans. And so when I train women, I connect them into that space of that energy where they are able to access those dimensional fields of pleasure and ecstasy through the experience of moving through dimensions and seeing energetic fields and communicating to spirit and moving energy and all of these things. And that's why even as I talk right now, even as I'm saying these things, you're getting energy waves moving through your body because of course, because again, this knowledge has been rooted in through women's anatomy. Oh my goodness. Hell, I feel like mic drop. I am so inspired listening to this and um, this may be extremely divine, but I'm listening to you and I know there is a next step for me um, in shamanism and maybe you're it. And that's something we can talk about offline, but I, I'm just saying, I'm throwing down that I'm really interested in what you offer because this is a, has been a very surprising, I don't know how many years for me since this unfolded. Uh, but you know, I'm following energy and it's just been glorious so far. So many questions I have for you. I want to start with this piece and then I'll go from there. So I am going to be speaking, I'm leaving, I'm flying out in about three and a half weeks to Mexico city. And, um, I am going to be doing a presentation specifically on UFOs, extraterrestrials and shamanism and where they interact intersect. Mm -hmm. And my fascination is I feel strongly that first open contact 
just like as a caveat, I know we've had contact with extraterrestrials since the beginning of time. I know our DNA is full of extraterrestrial. I'm not just human. You're not just human, et cetera. So with that said, I am talking about undeniable, <laughs> all of Earth knows, doesn't matter what the government says or media says, everyone will finally know the truth about extraterrestrials, open contact, and also who we will be connecting with. And then how the shamans have always known and how they will lead the way for us to heal humanity and heal the planet. And I want to be really clear, the planet doesn't need saving, the planet needs loving. Humanity doesn't need saving, it needs loving. With that said, what could you share? What could you impart about those three pieces, UFOs, extraterrestrials, and the intersection of shamanism? Yes. So in ancient times, it was known that women would open their vessels energetically through ceremony with everyone making um, a circle around the women. And they would make contact with a lot of beings from other places that would give them the ability to share that wisdom and that knowledge with their tribe extraterrestrials as people call it on earth in fact it's just our brothers and sisters who are operating in a different level of consciousness but the same consciousness from the collective understanding meaning that they are operating in a different consciousness because they don't adhere to a lot of the same ways in which we operate in the ability to take claiming over something or create war or any of these types of things they operate in an intelligence that operates in the field of of love spectrum so sex color race none of those things mean anything to them what they operate on is a unified field of, of information a field of information that supports a, a unity consciousness between other galaxies other planets and other dimensional fields human beings are still operating in what we call old primal selective energy uh, operating in the intelligence that the more that they're right are the perfection that they seek to be they are um, superior beings and therefore if they have done let's say a bunch of ayahuasca ceremonies this one is doing yoga this one is doing this they call themselves spiritual whereas in the understanding of um, off-world beings that has no place within consciousness other than those are the actions, but the consciousness is held within the perspective of the spectrum of love, which is infinite and eternal. And they seek to merge with us to, to share into that space of that infinite eternal love, to open that up as a bridge of consciousness. So bridging consciousness is very different to how we use our consciousness on this planet. And that's the reason why they have been slowly integrating in to um, our, our psyche and to our availability to witness them uh, either individually or collectively because human beings are still placing this identity on them. This is what a Palladian is. This is what an Octarian is. This is what this is. This is what that is because we only know things from the idea of labeling and suggestive um, connectivity through def def defining something. Beings in the off world do not define things like that. So they don't go in and say, I'm a Palladian and this is what we do and this is who we are and this is like, that's a human trait. So when they first started making contact with us, they started to play along with our consciousness where it's at, where it's in this place of seeing individuality and difference and differentness between each species. In the field of the what we call the um, in the the entirety, which means the eight planets um, from Mars and eight planets from Pluto, and you have the ring that goes all the way around, and you've got all the different uh, different beings. We are all operating on a, a conscious consensus of bridging consciousness throughout space and time. 
So outside of time and inside of time, therefore creating um, availability for knowledge to move from this dimension and across to inter intergalactic dimensions. But in order to do that, the species on the planet has to be able to remove those ideas of you versus me, this versus that. All this duality creates what we call um, a, a separation uh, mm -hmm. that doesn't allow us to fully take in the knowledge that they would need us to take in to create that bridge. Mm -hmm. So so the process that people are getting is for them to be able to help us to raise our consciousness by seeing our abilities in ourselves. But human beings still like to create their idols. So they put, you know, oh, these higher self, this being here, and this being has power, and I'm a human being, and this is what they are, and that's a dog, and that's a cat, and that's a that. When we remove those energies and we get out of that space, the capacity for love of human love transcends beyond human love. And the structures that have been holding all of these energies in duality, separation, some uh, different types of energies that have been showing up on earth that people are experiencing right now with all the calamities and things that are happening on the planet are distracting frequencies that are being created internally first and projected into the world by the mistrust we have in the merging of consciousness to build these bridges. And so that's what they're doing right now is to assist us. And shamans were more available to this because shamans are not here to judge. We're, we know that judgment is a, is a third finite mind behavior that doesn't show you who the person is. It only shows you what you, your beliefs are. And we don't believe in constructs and beliefs to define the universe. Wow. So, so the reason why human beings are not still operating in this, what we call flux of evolution, is because they're still in this idea that they have to be smart, they have to be intelligent, they have to show people that they have powers, they have to do all of these things that have nothing to do with spiritual evolution because spirituality doesn't mean that you, that you eat healthy food or you go do yoga or you take a workshop or any of these things. It means evolution and evolution cannot be held if you are not willing to take instruction from God, from spirit, um, from, from the higher beings of love. And when I say higher beings, I don't mean higher in the way we say higher. I mean higher in the sense of defining frequencies that we can actually merge into to build what we call one bridge. So, so the intellect of humanity is still operating on the need to prove their value, their worth, to get love from other people, to, to be seen, to be known. All of these things are creating a, a dissonance. And so, so the beings in the other planets, what we call ETs, when that's just the word we call, and that's fine, again, it's another definition. They are beings who are operating in the place of getting us to let go of these very limited, very heavy, very weighed down attachments mm -hmm. so that we can come into a space of oneness where the understanding of self is not by the color or by the race or by you're a woman, I'm a man and I do this and you do this and I'm a celebrity and you're not, whatever, all these things that humans do is to understand the divinity through the alignment of God consciousness, which is pure love, the emanating energy of love that can speak through all levels of communication and all understandings of consciousness are merged into oneness. So that's not like you're meeting them for the first time. You are them and they that's are you. A hundred percent. They are us in the future. They are the advanced us. They are our brothers and sisters. They are our cousins. They are our true family. And if there is no separation, then there's no separation with the cosmos. And if there is duality, such as you just expressed, they're another piece of what is truly spiritual, which is 
love, pure love, unconditional, uh, nothing but love. The other piece of it is to put an end to controlling and greed and all these, you know, corporations who, and political factions who do insane things just to get ahead or get an extra dollar. And I, I would really love to see love wipe that out, neutralize that. Yes, but, so it, but in order to do that, there's a way you have to move into a different level of thinking, right? Because the idea of those things, right? People go, oh, those things are horrible. Those things are bad. Those things are this, those things are that. That's exactly what the system wants you to do. Because you're taking your consciousness and bridging with that. And so what the, what the spirits are saying is your consciousness the human consciousness, the spirit consciousness is so much more valuable than humans yet understand that even just me thinking of, of, let's say, the love that I have for that tree, I am merging with that tree and bridging. So when you bridge into what the system wants you to bridge into, which is chaos, lack, destruction, degradation, death, you name it. Black. That's why they want you to bridge into it. Mm -hmm. Because all they have to do is get you to turn your attention, because attention is the most powerful resource on our planet. Turn your attention mm -hmm. to that which they can take your energy and bridge into that energy. So it becomes a, a force. That's why, that's what they did when they created the whole story of God being God being angry and, and you're a sinner and you're this and you're that. They need people to bridge into those things because then it traps you from being able to access the what we call the quantum field of, of light intelligence that is waiting for you to bridge into that for what we call fifth dimensional ascension. Have you had UFO extraterrestrial direct experiences? Yes, of course. Absolutely. Yeah? Quite yes. a bit or? Absolutely. Yeah. You want to, can you share a little <laughs> or a lot? <laughs> well, when I was a kid, I used to shake and convulse. And I had these um, very loud sounds, like, sound, like really loud sounds. And one day this um, uh, being stood in front of me with big eyes and he communicated to me and my heart and it wasn't like it scared me it was not it wasn't didn't matter what it looked like what it was what it was saying to me and how it was saying it to me and and the love that it was emulating to me was so bigger than anything I've ever felt as love, even today. And I love, I, my, my evolution of love is huge and it still didn't match that. And it was communicating to me to, <coughs> oh, excuse me, to, 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 to look into every aspect of myself of where I didn't feel safe on this planet to fully allow my, my full spectral energy to be seen and experienced because of people's ridicule, being made fun of, making people uncomfortable, um, people saying it's wrong. And that's what it was communicating to me. And then another time I was in Joshua Tree with some friends and same thing happened again. There I was out and it was like this square box opened and I could see into this other dimension and there were these beings that were so tall and it was looking at me and it asked to borrow my body. And what I remember was I was taken into a like a spaceship, but it was more like liquid. And I was um, there in this spaceship that was liquid and it was in my body and it was communicating to all my friends and my friends said oh my god an et took over you it said the most interesting things we've never heard in our life 
And then the sun, it told me it would leave by sunrise. And when the sun came, this, this beautiful bird flew over and all of a sudden I was back in my body. And then I had that experience again when I was living in Egypt. And when I was living in Egypt, I went to the pyramids and I had a memory of my life of being a pharaoh and being in communion with these beings. And I started dreaming all these symbols. And I remember seeing myself with this woman and I was a young, I was a young kid whose father had died and I was ascending the throne in Egypt and I was very angry. And I remember the counsel that I used to get was from these beings that would come and commune with us. And I remember the sound frequencies that they would help us use to build the pyramids. And I started remembering how levitation and all these different things were happening. And what was interesting was um, I got really angry when I saw the Sphinx's nose, when I saw the degradation and how the people treated the land. And I remember screaming in the street and this little boy came up to me and my friend was there, my friend Franco, he was from Italy. He came and he said, um, and my friend said, I'm so sorry for my friend screaming. And my friend, and the little boy said, I know why he's screaming. And Franco goes, why? And he goes, because he's one of our ancients and he's, he's, uh, he's very upset. And my mother told me, she pointed to him when he was walking down the street, that he's one of the ancients. And I had, uh, while I was at the pyramid, I had constant uh, ETs visiting me. Um, and they were drawing all of these symbols around my body. My body started shaking. Um, they told me the reason why was because the energy, my body, my physical form had to get comfortable with the energies that they were drawing into me. And they were telling me about the gateways that women have to open. And I said, uh, you know, please tell me more about that. And they said that, um, that what we call magic on the planet or ancient magic was literally the teachings of their people that were given to us um, and being able to move energy and to communicate telepathically and to be able to access um, levitation and all these different things. And they said that it was, it was governed by women, <clears throat> excuse me, it was governed by women to hold those sacred um, uh, uh, information and laws on how to utilize those energies. And because women were persecuted to not express themselves in their fullness, um, they've been burying that, that knowledge deep inside of them and that it was one of my roles um, because I'm an Andromedian to which really again doesn't mean anything other than just i'm an andromedian from andromeda um to uh come and to unlock those uh frequencies within women so that they can then begin to research magic what we call magic but it's basically the the powers that were given to us um through these other beings that made a pact with all of us so that we can be able to utilize that to re redefine our planet and redefine each other. And so I've always felt that it was my journey to do so. And one of the spirits had told me that one day I will be called and they'll come to me. And I was living in Greece at the time in Santarini and an ET came in to my room and it was standing there looking at me and it sent a message, like, like I was looking into its big eyes and it sent a message saying, go to where Mother Mary spent her last days. So I, I had no idea what that meant. And then I got a phone call from my friend in Turkey and she said, a bunch of women and I are going to Ephesus. And I said, what's Ephesus? And she said, that's where Mother Mary spent her last days. You should get on a ferry boat and come meet us. And so I jumped on, I jumped on a ferry boat went to Ephesus, did the pilgrimage up to the top of the mountain where everyone hangs their crutches and stuff once they drink the water because Mother Mary died, the water came from the earth, people drink it and they get healed. 
And so I went and I drank the water and I saw all of these beings walking around and they took me to this mountain and they drew this symbol and they said, this is the symbol that will unlock people's powers. And it's called the Quintarium. Remember this, but do not share it with the world for 18 years. And I said, 18 years. I said, why? I said, because their consciousness is not ready to be matured enough to access that power. So I said, okay. And then when I share it, what they said, we will give you instructions. And so uh, 18 years passed and I got this instruction to create a, a beautiful uh, a quantum device that has the quintarium in, um, on it with a friend of mine named Evan, they said, they said they'll bring the person to me who's a master of magnetics. And he came right into my life and we built this device called the SO or the spirit optimizer. And when people use it, it awakens lot, hidden powers in them that they never knew was there. And it's been such an experience and they, every time they use it, they're connecting with these beings that are teaching them how to utilize powers that go way back in time and resurfacing them in the moment. And literally, I was at uh, just in Encinitas, I was doing a, a love shop. And one of the people who work at the healing center said, I, I want to try the SO. And she put it on her thing, on her leg. And then it, and she spoke to the SO and she said she saw a flash of light and her heart started expanding and she felt waves of, of codes going through her body. And she looked at the person who runs the place, Isha, and goes, oh, my God, this is crazy. And we've been we've been doing experimentations with doctors and kids and all these different people. And so so I have a very strong connection to sometimes they come through my body um, in my healing temples and talk to everyone. There's moments I wake up and they're standing in my room talking to me. Um, I call them the great council. Um, the great council, uh, they tell me things like, for instance, I have a spirit by the name of Grumble. Grumble is a rock elf oh. and he communicates to me every single thing that's going on. And then I have a Lorian who is an ET who comes and he speaks to me and express and tells me about, um, you know, the, in, the last year I was with a bunch of friends and I said, oh, guess what? The government's not going to be able to hold the thing about ETs anymore. And they're like, how do you know? I said, because the ETs told me that next year is the year when the, the information is going to be released. And all my friends called me when the big Congress thing happened. Um, and they're like, you were right. And I said, yeah, they tell me. And even when the, the 9-11, uh, 9-11 was another one, they told me, but also the uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. And then I wrote the book, Spirit Hacking. Mm -hmm. And the book was supposed to be called 2020, Are You Ready? A Guide mm -hmm. Through Darkness to the Light. And my publisher didn't like the name because he said it was too intense. And they said, you're going to have a blackout for 20 years and in that 20 year period, you're going to go through a lot of war. You're going to go through all these different things and you need to prepare people to be able to move through it. And so that's why I wrote the book, because I'm not a person who likes to write books. Trust me, it's very tedious, takes a lot. <laughs> of and I just don't have time. You know, I'd rather be lecturing and speaking and so forth. I wrote the book and the book is literally people write me. They're like, oh, my God, this is a guide to what's going on right now. I'm mm -hmm. like, exactly. And we talk about a lot of those things. And what's interesting is that the ETs are not like a lot of people are like, oh, what planet did I come from? Oh, what, what ET group do I belong to? It's completely irrelevant. What's what's relevant is the bridging. That's what they said is relevant, is the merging of. Like, for instance, uh, we have these things called um, spirit sprites. Spirit sprites is what allows you to use magic, right? So like, for instance, if you put your hand out like this, right, and then say spirit sprites. Spirit sprites. Land in my hand. Land in my hand. And then tell me when you, when you feel something. Mm -hmm. 
Now, do you see how you feel that? Yeah. That's a spirit sprite. They're floating all around us all the time. Then you say, spirit sprite, merge with me. Spirit sprite, merge with me. And what does that feel like? Light. Yeah. Bubbly. Uh-huh. Now, now watch this. Say mind. Mind. Generate a spark from the spirit sprites in my body. It already happened. Ha! Mind. Generate. a Say the rest of the sentence. You said it and it happened. So can uh -huh. you say the rest of the sentence? Mind. Generate a spark from the spirit sprites in my body. Mm. Mind generate a spark from the spirit sprites in my body. Yeah, it's like done. So the difference between uh, wizards and witches and and druids and shamans and all of these things is how much spirit sprites you have in your body. Really? What mm -hmm. really? So the more you have, the more abilities you have, the more connections yes. you have. Yes. Fascinating. And a lot of the spirit sprites usually come in our childhood. They're all around us. They're all floating around right now. The, in our childhood, they come in because spirit sprites are attracted to playfulness. Mm -hmm. They're attracted to laughter. They're attracted mm -hmm. to love. They're attracted to these types of energy. So when, so if you're a person who holds those frequencies, they come in even more. And you call them into your body to merge with you. Your powers go stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. All of a sudden, you're like, oh, my God. I'll, like, I have people who never thought they were psychic. And we connected them into the spirit sprites and activated their energies. And they're like psychics and traveling the world and seeing people and talking and doing things. Because the shamans, the witches, the sorceresses, the wizards, the druids, all of the being, beings who come from the magical cloth know that there are all these magical beings that are around us that merge with us to give us human give our human bodies power i love that your cousin tell the completely different tangent here but your cousin true story was fats or is fats domino yes that's crazy so on my, did dad, you go on my dad's side he used to come to the house all the time when i was a kid very very loud <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, like David, 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 tell you, tell your son about the story of the time when we were on the road and that girl we met at the at the at the at the end of a, at the end of the at the end of the the gig and we went over to the the jute joint and like just loud, loud. But the stories were beautiful. It helped me to understand a lot about my father because he was his road manager, mm. and it was tough for them because. They didn't have banks where they could put their money. They traveling, did, traveling uh, yeah. anywhere. Oh, yeah. No. They, so every time they had to, you know, they made money. They only got paid in fives and ones. They had to stack it in the back of a trunk. And Ugh. and then every time they would go to another town, the people in the town who were um, didn't want them there would sure. hang the local blacks right. from trees right. and then shoot out their tires so they can steal their bank. So they had to put someone, that's where that saying, you know, people go shotgun. Riding shotgun? Yes, because you would, they hire someone to sit in the front seat with a shotgun. Oh my to God. the bank. Oh, that's genius. I never knew that. Yeah. So, so my father had to take different routes and different things. It was very challenging. Um, you know, Fats wasn't given the respect a lot to be able to, um, you know, sit with all his colleagues of mute in the music world. Yeah. They had, the, you know, they put them in very small places, really, really bad hotels. You know, um, just a, a, it was very challenging. Um, my father said at that time, but Fats was great. Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, he was amazing. He used to come over to the house. Um, Kareem Abdul Jabbar used to come over to the house. My dad was very connected, like with Sidney Poitier. Mm. Uh, he was very, my dad was, you know, my dad was a very influential person because of being with Fats. He met so many people on the road and so many people at different parties and so forth. So when I was a kid, my home was like a disco palace. It was like, <laughs> my dad would have these parties and he had this big disco ball and this DJ. 
and then and, and all the most interesting people would come and I was this little kid looking at people with platforms on and coming in the door you know and so yeah it was quite amazing and my aunt too my aunt is one of the most world famous opera soprano uh, mezzo soprano she's a uh, renowned uh, with Pavarotti Placio Domingo she uh, is the first black mezzo soprano it's next uh, with her colleague uh, Leah Tone Price so I grew up with waking up to Pavarotti in my living room at, on the piano, you know, with her practicing their, their, what they were singing before they go and perform it. Um, and my aunt said something to me very interesting as a kid. I asked her one time, like, what's it like to sing to all those people? And she said to me, darling, I don't sing to the people. I sing for myself and they get to enjoy it. And when she said that to me, oh. it helped me to really shape myself as Shaman Durek. Mm. Really be so? Because I used to be so scared. I was a very shy kid mm. and I used to be afraid of ridicule or people making fun of me or people, you know, liking me or not liking me. And what it did for me is it made me go, I'm just doing what I'm just the bringing, sharing and bringing the message. And if people don't like it, they don't like it. And if they do, they do. And that's their choice. But it's not going to make or break me. And that's helped me a lot in my life with the media because I get constantly um, the media constantly comes at, at me and people are like, oh, did you read what, the, what they said about you in the London Times? Did you read about what they said about you in the New York Times? Did you read about I said, they're not talking when they're saying something that, that is not coming from love mm. and expressing the being of light that I am. Mm. They're not talking about me, you guys. So don't worry about it. They're like, what do you mean? I said, they're not talking about me. I don't know who they're talking about, but it's not me, you know, and, and I've learned from my aunt sharing that with me. It was this message of don't do what you do because people like you or people don't like you, don't do it for people to clap for you or put you up on a pedestal. Do it because you love doing it and it makes you happy. And that helped me a lot because I've had clients, celebrity clients come in who don't want to hear the truth about things. And I tell them exactly. And then they, they, you know, curse me out and get mad at me and all this kind of stuff. And then I, friends of mine would be like, oh my God, if they told me off like that, I'd probably just stop being Shaman Durek. I said, but I'm not here for their praise and I'm not here for, for their booze. I'm here to be who I am. And, and that's, that's it. And so that client came back two weeks later apologizing and saying everything you said was right. I just wasn't ready to accept it. And would you see me again? And this person really didn't like cur curse me out and I, like went crazy. And I said, look, I have no problem being there to support you, but you have to understand I'm a man of peace. And so if you can just be a peaceful person, I would love to see you, you know, but with all that stuff, all that antics and all that stuff you were doing, the yelling and the cursing and all that, that's just the stuff that you were dealing with because you didn't, you didn't really think that someone like me could have such access to such information and that's okay. You know, I've had people, celebrities come in and I say to them, so you did coke last night? And they said, what? Why would you say that? I said, because spirit told me you did coke last night. They're like, I didn't do coke last night. I go, what are you talking about? You were with Suge Knight doing coke. Why would you lie to me? Don't, don't lie to me. I have the spirits. They tell me everything I need to know. And she's like, oh, okay, fine. You're right. I did the coke. I said, exactly. So, and I think that's also been beneficial as well too, because I, I work with such high profile people and, and people who are not high profile, because I don't think that a celebrity is better than a person who's not a celebrity. I think everyone is celebrities in my, in my thing, right? And so I treat everyone equally and I tell people exactly what I think. You know, I tell Gwyneth what I think, I tell everybody what I think, and if they have a problem with it, that's their problem and they can deal with it. But I'm here to love you. And if I love you, I'm gonna tell you the truth. I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm not gonna bullshit you. I'm not gonna play games with you just because I need your, oh, you're amazing, Shaman Dirk, you're so amazing. No, I'm not looking for that. I'm here to, to be as God asked me to be. And that's it.
And so whatever people choose to say or however they choose to receive things or whatever, it doesn't matter. And I think my aunt saying that mm -hmm. really put me in the right place. Yeah, I'm a singer. So that is huge for me to hear. That is a completely different point of view. I absolutely never considered. Thank you for that. And um, I'm so excited to hear everything you're sharing because in transparency, I booked a session with you next week. Oh, so, lovely. Uh, yes, I'm going to be one of these people sitting with you and um, I'm ready. Bring it. I really mean bring it. Oh, I don't worry, so darling. Ready. I'll bring it. Yeah. I am so ready for that level. Like I said, I saw your work. I saw those clips and I was like, oh my God, this is so for real what you are accessing. It is so refreshing to me. Um, it's you know rare. what's so funny about that with the whole mm. thing with the doctors is that my publicist was trying to get me into the doctors and the doctors kept saying, we will never have anyone come in who's spiritual. So just know that. And I said, okay. And so my publicist said, well, can you at least meet with him? And so they thought I was going to come with like robes and kimono. <laughs> Entourage, <laughs> incense <Yeah>. burning. <laughs> incense burning. And I told my team, I said, when we go into this meeting, everyone put a suit on, dress very oh. nice. You know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna walk into their world and look like their world. But mm. what pops out of my mouth is going gonna, is gonna to blow them away. Awesome. So I go in there. And I meet with the boardroom and everything, and they're talking to me and they're looking at me and the, the, the people who run the Paramount pictures and everything where it's shot, they were asking me questions and, and I told them what the spirits were telling me. And they were like, how do you know that? And I said, because the spirits told me. And they said, but how can we translate this into a show? I said, it's quite simple, actually. You put me in field work and so you have the show, bring people on who have um, difficult issues put me on field work where you take me and the camera crew to their homes, wherever they're working, whatever they're doing. And I will go and I will show you what I do and I will make it so mainstream. I won't go into woo woo. I won't do anything that makes it where the doctors can't talk about it in real time. And they're like, okay, let's give it a shot. And so they called me in and they gave me a script. Um, and it was like a big script and I had to memorize everything. And um, and then we went in and at the end of the show, the head person of Paramount came all the way from her office with tears in her eyes, crying, going, I can't believe what I just saw. We've been waiting for someone like you to be able to break down the wall, to be able to bring something spiritual that it can actually make sense to mainstream audience. And we would love for you to continue doing stuff. So I did that for about a year and a half. They gave me a bigger dressing room. I got to do like, you know, it, it was amazing. It was amazing. But then, the, then they were like, oh, we want to give you your own talk show. Um, and we want to build it, you know, um, on, on lot 40, on, I think it was lot 49 or something. And, but then the pandemic broke out. And so the show we had to, they had to stop doing the show uh, because of COVID. Um, but the thing was that I thought was very fascinating was the doctors who would come backstage and go, how did you do that? How did you do that? Like, I've never seen anything like that in my life. How is that even possible? And they, it's, it, so it was really a, a graceful way of opening up their consciousness to what is possible through spirit versus the way they were taught, which is I'm a doctor, this is how it is, this is the way it looks and so forth. And I started getting a lot of doctors coming to me and asking me to support them mm. and help them. And that's been a great reward in itself. Wow. Support them with their patients, you mean, uh, uh -huh. in the work they do? Yes. Or support them individually as Both. a doctor? Both. Hmm. Wow, that's exceptional. And I know uh, Dave Asprey wrote in your book, Spirit Hacking, I don't understand what this guy does, but he does it. Like, I don't understand where these gifts come from. And so it's one thing to hear that. It's another thing to see you in action. Um, and, you know, that's it. That's the real work. And I'm- The real so love. The real love. The real love. 
How amazing. It's so beautiful that you couch it like that. And I'm excited. I'm excited for what you provide. I'm excited for what's possible. I'm here in LA. So I think um, there'll be more to come. I want to ask you, speaking of Los Angeles, next year, February 2024, I am going to have in our show notes the link to get tickets for Los Angeles Conscious Life Expo. You're going to be there for the first time that I know of. Yes. I am very excited. I will be there. Tell me what you're going to be speaking about. I'm going to be speaking about source code, and I'm going to be showing people how to access their powers and their energies. And I'm going to be op making transmissions and opening up energies for people so that they can access those things, such as being able to speak to their uh, guidance system, to be able to move energy and to help them understand what source code is and how to connect into source code. So they're not getting information that's been manipulated by other people's opinions, but it's coming directly from source, which I think is very important. And I'm also going to have a booth where I'll be doing demonstrations with the SO Quintarium, which I told you about. We're going to have um, the, the Oracle cards that I have and my book there. Um, and my new meditation app that's launching soon, that is going to be mind blowing. What Dave Asprey actually was really funny because Dave came about because my publicist called his person who ran his company and she never answers the phone because everybody wants a piece of Dave and she answered the phone and she said a voice spoke to her and said, answer the phone. So she answered the phone and then she's like, okay, put me on the phone with Shaman Durek. I was on the phone with her five minutes. She goes, okay, I don't need to talk to you anymore. I know you're the real deal. I'm going to have you get 10 minutes with Dave. That's it. So I get transferred to Dave. 10 minutes. He goes, you got 10 minutes. I've worked with shamans all over the world. I've done plant medicine. I've done this. I've done that and all this kind of stuff. And I looked at him and I said, that's wonderful. I'm so glad that you've had those experiences. But I'm a spirit shaman and um, I do things a bit different. And he goes, like, what, you don't work with medicines? And I said, I don't need to work with medicines when there's spirit. I can have spirit of the tree go into your body and make you puke in a bucket if that's what you really need. You know, it's 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 whatever. And so he he was like, OK, OK. And so he I told him some things that, that he no, he's never told anyone. And then he said, well, I have a problem right now. And I said, what? And he said, I have a pain in my my back. And I said, OK, I can remove that pain. And he goes, how? And I go, just give me a second. I'll have to send a spirit over to you to, to do it. And so I sent the spirit to do it. And he started vomiting. And he had this bowl near him. And he grabbed the bowl and he was vomiting in the bowl. And the pain was gone. And he was like, okay, I, I don't even know what to say. He goes, you are I, on a whole nother level. So he flew me and my team on a private plane to Canada to come to Alpha Base. Put, a, put my team up in the most beautiful hotel and me and him just bonded as brothers. Then he introduced me to all these doctors. And one day we were with one of these doctors, we were in a room with like seven doctors and they were asking me to demonstrate my, my abilities and I was showing them and they were in shock. And, they, and, and, and he said, oh, and Dirk can do other things too. And he, and he goes, Dirk, show them how you can take, take this whole room like an elevator into the underworld. And so I said, you guys gotta, bear bear with me for a second and then i took the whole room into the underworld and they were all freaking out they were like oh my god i can feel that i'm in another dimension and like everyone it was like freaking out and dave is funny because he'll always try to put me on the spot he'll be like show show jim quick show jim quick what you can do and you know and then jim quick will be there and he's like how do you do this how is this possible you know and i show him and and, you know, and Dave and I became very close friends. He's been close with my family and it was quite an experience. And he said to me, I told him I was going to write a book and he said, I'm writing the forward for your book and I'm going to do the forward on the audio thing too. He goes, because I have to say, Dirk, I have never in my life, never in my life. And the same thing with Gwyneth too. When I first met Gwyneth, when we became friends and she experienced my, what I do, she just said it was so intense for her. Um, she's never experienced anything like that. And for me, that's my normal, you know? So when people are making such a hype about it, I'm like, 
that's beautiful, but my focus isn't so much about you applauding me as it's more about me holding space for your intelligence, for your power, for your beauty, for your geniusness. And that's why I'm here. So people always think they're having a session with me, but they're not having a session with me. They're having a session with themselves. And I'm just here to hold space for your, for your power and how amazing you are. And so if I see that there's a place where you're not accessing your power, then I come in and go, okay, let's make a little things here and then bring you back to, the, to you because that's what it's about. I, like, I don't believe that I'm a guru. I don't believe that I'm better than people. I don't believe that I should be put up on a pedestal. I am here to walk side by side with all my brothers and sisters until we lift the veil of darkness and bring our other brothers and sisters home into the light. And then I can go back, go home, and 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 it's fine. So you know, we're we're equal. We're we're on this. Um, how do we say? Walking heart to heart, side by side. And when I meet a lot of spiritual people in this in in, in the realm of health and wellness and spirituality, and people who've written tons of books, and I spend time with them, they're all very like like I I I'm, I'm look at me and da da da. And I don't care about that. I'm like, this doesn't do anything. I don't know why you're doing this. It's about the people. I'm the shaman to the people. And that's it. Mm. Shaman Derek, this is Dare to Dream. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? What haven't you done? Well, I um, one of my future dreams and goals is to create, to work with um, um, um a psychotherapist and different types of people who can utilize shamanism and the mind who can we can get funding to create a, a, a lab where we can begin to start blind testing and doing these things to be able to show the science world what is possible so that they begin to start looking into those areas because there is definite proof and in, 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 um, uh, evidence. And so that's one of the things. The other thing is I'm getting married next year. So I'm excited about that. And I think being who I am as Shaman Dirk, but also being the first black man marrying into the royal family and being able to look at it from a different perspective than how Megan looked at it, but look at it from a, a spiritual place and bring the wisdom and knowledge to the people in that world so that they can get the information because that is something very important as well, I think. And I think God put me back in that spot to be able to share that knowledge and that information. And for me and my fiance, um, Princess Marta, to utilize our power to share more knowledge spiritually, because she's the first out of all the royals of her of the European royal family of her all of her cousins, to write seven Hay House books and to to speak to spirits since she was a little girl and she can do amazing healings and it's just really powerful and I think together we're a power couple that can go out in the world and really help people understand what relationships really are and what relationships aren't because a lot of times people think they're in a <clears throat> a lot of times people think they're in a relationship, but they're not. They're in a companionship um, and they're not in a relationship and like help people understand what that means. And so I think that's, you know, for me, uh, really creating things for humanity to increase their powers is my focus. We're so lucky to have you. And I really enjoyed this conversation it was so illuminating and I feel incredibly different in my body than we first started talking. I just want to thank you for being you and for stepping up despite your very difficult beginnings and just frankly owning all of who you are and all of what is possible to come through you to help us at a really important time. Thank you, Shaman Derek. I love you, sweetheart. Thank you for having me. It's such an honor. Mm, I love you as well. And folks, if you'd like to learn more, go to shamandurek.com. There's lots there to read and look at. You can get his book as well. And I end today's show with this quote from Shaman Durek. When someone judges you, they are not judging you. They are showing you their capacity for love and acceptance.
Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Leave a comment and share. And next week on the show, the amazing Jerome Martin will be here. He is a multidimensional coach connecting awakening starseeds to their galactic families, bringing powerful tools to create massive breakthroughs and shifts that transform lives and profound spiritual growth. Don't just dare to dream. Dare to create all your dreams and do so by leading with love. You'll change yourself, you'll change others' lives, and you'll change the direction and timeline for this planet. You are needed.